Free, Good Mark, Free Market Institute. Edita is here, <coughs> uh, the acting president. And we are happy to have such an extinguished um, um, panel, two panels that, uh, to be, to be uh, earnest here um, today to discuss one of the issues which is really at the heart of uh, uh, all uh, liberal strategics uh, and uh, which really uh, goes into what we are talking in these days about, that is uh, the stance of Europe in the worldwide uh, competition. So state aid, I guess, is in that sense a little uh, ambiguous. Um, paving the ground for opportunities on the one hand and maybe stand uh, in line of opportunities on the other hand. And I'm sure uh, that we will hear uh, a lot uh, of uh, new, maybe uh, good arguments uh, which have already been trained. So uh, without further ado, I think I can give the floor uh, to Cento, who is where? Right outside, okay. It's always with the same with competition, some people are late. <laughs> but um, as far as he is going to arrive, I take the opportunity just to tell you that the Free Hermann Foundation is uh, active in more than 60 countries uh, worldwide, and that uh, all what uh, surrounds competition um, and the economy is at the heart of what we do as an advocate for liberal markets. And now Chanto has arrived. I finished my words. I wish you a very good afternoon with uh, lots of uh, food of th uh, for thought and um, of course with lots of talks uh, in between with uh, the coffee breaks. But now Chanto, you have the word. Thank you so much. So I have to be fairly multi-skilled here because I've got to press this, hold this, and perhaps wave here sometimes. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, we've got an interesting uh, several hours of uh, perhaps more experienced and informed panelists than I am on this subject of uh, state aid. But uh, I think the state aid regime is entering a, a critical phase of reform. And a number of serious questions have been asked in Mertra and will be addressed at this conference. So I'm going to give a sort of a helicopter <coughs> view of the state aid issue as I see it. Um, and the panelists will consider uh, in panel one the fair competition and procedural challenges of the state aid regime. And then after the coffee break in panel two, they'll be considering uh, state owned enterprises and the issues raised by that. So, there was a state aid the modernization uh, uh, consultations and outcome in 2014, and we're entering another one in 2020. Um, and some of the issues that will be addressed by the panels are, is state aid a prohibition with too many exceptions? Should the EU policy objectives override state aid concerns? What is the role of competition in the assessment of state aid? What direction should the state aid modernization program for 2020 take? And what about state owned enterprises? There are obviously a number of threats uh, to the boundary between the state and private <coughs> enterprise and risks to competition. And uh, even within the EU, there's a there appears to be some sort of re-emergence of EU industrial policy, and uh, the most recent example is the uh, amount of money given to battery technology by uh, the European Commission, or permitted to be given to battery technology. Uh, there are a lot of uh, policy objectives that uh, override state aid concerns, such as the environment, energy efficiency, employment to some extent, the digital economy. Their concerns uh, that can be, can be directed against the state aid regime, which is basically a, looking at the taxation, subsidies and grants of, wh of uh, whether the whole concept of state aid as applied to those aspects of it may 
uh, reduce competition, and I'm here thinking of competition between taxation regimes. Uh, and some of the more free market people would say that there should be competition between taxation regimes and we shouldn't uh, block that. Uh, but that is not the way the European Commission is going, as uh, Donald Trump has reminded us about that tax lady, uh, the, the competition commissioner. And then there's the general threat of renationalization, which is not central to the state aid regime, but it's central to the role played with the state and the, and the market. And it, we're having a general election in the UK, where all grandiose claims and propositions are being put forward. Uh, this is perhaps the mildest of one, is Boris Johnson says he's going to relax the state aid rules uh, because he wants British people to buy British goods. Um, and then, of course, the Labour Party uh, has proposed the renationalization, well, <laughs> could be the renationalization, although we didn't have broadband when we were nationalized, the nationalization of our broadband infrastructure, giving free uh, broadband to everyone, uh, the renationalization of water, rail, and some other industries. Um, and, an, and a, even the <coughs> potential, uh, not quite the renationalization, but mm. giving tenants the right to buy properties that are being rented to them. So uh, there's quite a lot of pressure uh, being put, particularly in the political environment, not only in the UK, but across the countries of intervention and uh, the desire to uh, uh, have a new industrial policy, coupled with the general concern about the a failure of antitrust generally uh, to deal with some of the more pressing issues that have arisen in the, the market economy. Now, just b by way of background, what is a state aid? Well, uh, state aid law c controls state financial intervention to ensure fair competition. That's a very crude and probably misleading uh, definition. But uh, it covers grants, subsidies, <coughs> tax rebates, loan and state guarantees. And it's a relatively unique feature of EU antitrust law. There is not a central f feature. I spent a, nearly a lifetime working in competition law, and I rarely come across a state aid case. It's quite a specialized area. And by way of evidence, there's a classic uh, standard textbook on competition law by Wishard, uh, <coughs> Richard Wish and, uh, and Bailey, which has a, a thousand pages on competition law and only two pages on state aid law. So it's a, considered, I was going to say exotic, but that makes it sound too exciting. It's a, a specialized area. And the, the, the commissioner in her previous uh, peri uh, period of office made the state aid a priority of the commission, and particularly uh, uh, getting at the preferential treatment given to some of the digital companies like Apple. More formally, state aid, Article 107 of the full, uh, Treaty of the, full, uh, of the European Union. This is the provision, save as otherwise provided, and I ask you to bear that expression in mind, in the treaties, any aid granted by a member state or through state resources in any form whatsoever which distorts or threatens to distort competition by favoring certain undertakings or the production of certain goods shall insofar as the <coughs> trade between member states be incompatible with the internal market. So basically, it's uh, provided by the state, and the litmus test is whether it distorts or threatens to distort competition by being discriminatory in the sense of favouring some undertakings and uh, distorting competition. Now, this is the part I've just read out, and I'll just t uh, pinch this from a, a House of Commons Parliament uh, publication, and this shows the procedure uh, to evaluate state aid. Uh, are state resources involved? Is the beneficiary in involved in economic activity? And then it says if, if the answer is no, no, no state aid exists. And we get down, you know, does the beneficiary get an advantage? Does the market economy operate as a principal apply? We'll come to that in a minute. Is the good or service theoretically tradable across member states? So if the answer though, is no, there's no state aid, but some of it's yes. Then we go to this part. Now, what's that part? 
and I think this is one of the concerns of the conference organizers and some of the panelists, that part is the exemptions to the state aid rules. Articles 2 and 3. I'm not going to read it through, but it's you know, aid for natural disasters, aid to the Federal Republic of Germany for the uh, integration, uh, economic development, you know, disasters in the economy, aid to facilitate the development of certain economic activities, etc., etc. Um, and crudely, we have a state aid control, which consists of 56 words in the treaty, and we've got the exceptions to state aid which consists of 100, 280 words describing where state aid is good. So I think that's one of the issues that's going to be discussed in the panel, the first panel. Are there too many exceptions to the state aid regime? Uh, now, the 2014 uh, modernization and the general block exemption regulation increased the thresholds for the uh, evaluation of state aid, created a load of... Uh, Additional categories of exempted aid, such as aid to local uh, areas, broadband, research and energy infrastructure, innovation clusters, regional <coughs> urban development funds, cultural and heritage, conservation, audiovisual works, sports and recreational infrastructure, SMEs, and natural disasters, led to some simplification. But it then devolved the assessment of state aids to the member states. So 96%, I think, from 2014 onwards of state aid uh, assessments are handled by member states. So the Commission is sitting on top of all this, uh, but it's up to the member states. And of course, this is one of the paradoxes, the, the member states are the ones that are giving the state aid. So uh, the question whether administratively I can see the convenience of all that. <coughs> But also, it does lead to somewhat of a conflict of interest, to put it mildly. The, the SAM 2014 package led to a whole new set of guidelines of how to assess areas in various sectors. I'm not going to go into that. And the concerns that have been expressed about the current state aid system is this lack of transparency because it's devolved to the member states and it's hard to find out what's going on. Uh, there may be different applications of member states, and I'm sure these issues are going to be well rehearsed in the consultations that were the new package. There's a lack of legal certainty, particularly if you don't know what's going on and the differences between the member states. There's concern about is there sufficient competitive assessment uh, and what counterfactuals these assessments are being uh, compared against. Um, uh, is there sufficient ex post evaluation? There's been a report come out uh, proposing an ex post evaluation, but you know, you say these state aids are not going to distort competition, they are implemented, we have to evaluate whether they have or have not distorted competition, so they have an ex post ex uh, exception. And is there a proper recovery procedure and remedies? But when, the when a member state gives someone, or the authority gives someone funds, a grant, and then it's decided that this is actually a state aid, uh, do the member states recover the money and what are the rights and uh, uh, remedies available to those who have been harmed by the uh, uh, state aid? And of course, <coughs> probably an internal commission type of issues has the state aid modern, modern, modernization uh, program of 2014 achieved its own objectives. In order to evaluate uh, in areas where it's <coughs> unclear, where it's not a, a, a gross explicit subsidy, the state aid procedure has this uh, market economy operator, or market economy investor principle. Uh, and this is a sort of, a, let's, let's call it a technocratic way of assessing whether uh, a market economy operator would have made the same investment to the beneficiary in the same circumstances. Uh, <coughs> if the answer, that should be read no. The answer is no, it's an illegal state aid. And there seems to me to be so somewhat of a contradiction between this principle uh, and uh, the logic that it uh, tries to portray. Because if a market economy operator would have made that investment, you can well and ask the question, why didn't it? Uh, what is the rationale for 
going through this exercise and finding that, yes, a market economy operator would have made that investment, uh, and then uh, looking at why, it had, why the market hadn't made that investment in the first place. The reason might be market failure, but it needs an explicit uh, identification of what this market failure is. And I also ask the question, having done a lot of business plans in the past, is how do we uh, suppose that the uh, member state says we want to set up an Uber because the market's not going to do that, or a WeWorks uh, office project? Uh, how would they apply the MEIP <coughs> principle to that? Uh, as we know, these guys are not making profits and not projected to make profits for. Uh, decades, and WeWork has got itself into a lot of problems. They're just burning cash. So, these are market operators. How do we, had, had you done this in the dot-com boom, what sort of assessment would you have made of uh, the, the various digital applications and investment in uh, broadband infrastructure that, that then turn out to be loss-making and bankrupt of the companies? So, there are a lot of issues surrounding this uh, technocratic sort of principle of how to assess whether an investment or a subsidy is, uh, uh, satisfies market principles. And of course, it doesn't ultimately address the competition issue. Uh, how much time do yeah, Okay. So, as I said, one has to identify the market failure. Uh, under the market pr uh, operator principle, you have to assess whether there's a necessity of that uh, grant or subsidy. This leads to a hornet's nest of issues over the appropriate counterfactuals. Uh, and anyone who's uh, been in court arguing about counterfactuals will see that uh, there's an infinite number of counterfactuals and it's quite arbitrary as to which one you choose given your underlying model of what the market economy would be doing in, in the alternative. Uh, proportionality only that amount needed, and the focus on, as I've said already, on the financials rather than the competitive assessment. Uh, State-owned enterprises. Uh, <coughs> not central to uh, <coughs> the state aid regime. Isn't it? There was a big debate in the United Kingdom about a year ago, and that's why the Labour Party was all in favour of Brexit because it thought that the state aid regime blocked its uh, policies of renationalization. Uh, that subsequently has <coughs> been informed that that's not the case, um, and so they've become much more uh, uh, amenable to Brexit, uh, although one's never clear where <laughs> British politics stands on all these issues. But the, the, to cut a long story short, th there is a concern about uh, what I would call state aid, and I can give uh, something that the Institute of Economic Affairs has been uh, uh, quite agitated about, of course, the uh, public service broadcasting and the BBC. The BBC is a state-owned uh, enterprise that has different legal forms of trust. Uh, but it, re it re receives taxation from, a hypothecated tax from uh, those who own television sets. But it also has massive advantages in, in the sense that it receives free airwaves, free radio spectrum whereas the other operators have to pay for their spectrum. Uh, and so th there is a big issue. I know that this is one of the areas carved out, public service broadcasting from the state aid regime. Um, but uh, there's an absolutely no doubt that the BBC, in its uh, activities in the marketplace, has resulted <coughs> in a lot of anti-competitive uh, interventions. I want to conclude with uh, an area that's of particular interest to, to me is the recovery of state aid when it's been illegally given and the rights to uh, those who've been harmed by the state aid, uh, this illegal state aid, to receive compensation. And uh, the Commission has uh, published very recently a study on the enforcement rules and decisions of state aid by national courts. And this study found that uh, there are 172 cases in the member states' national courts brought by uh, public agencies and 595, 94 
private enforcement cases. So the private enforcement of the state aid regime on this recovery remedies issue uh, is three times that of the public enforcement cases. But the national courts really find an unlawful state aid. 32% of public enforcement, 66 of private enforcement claims were rejected. Uh, and re recovery and interim measures to suspend the information rarely successes. And this study found that only in six uh, was compensation given for breach of standstill. And less than one, that's less than one percent of private enforcement cases got compensation for the effects. And so. There are a number of issues that are arising in this devolved national uh, member state enforcement or national court enforcement of, of standstill obligations and illegal state aids. Is um, how do we bring into play another mechanism uh, for the uh, enforcement of uh, the state aid provisions? And what principles should govern the compensation uh, that are received by the parties? who have been harmed by an illegal state aid. Uh, is recovery and compensation sufficient? If, you, if someone's been given a legal state aid and it's operated for one or two years without assistance, uh, it's increased its market share, uh, its competitors have suffered as a result of this, is recovering the state aid just sufficient to uh, remedy this situation, take back the money? Uh, it may have done irreparable harm to competitors. Some competitors may have been driven out of business. Uh, and some uh, competitors' future uh, uh, prospects may have been harmed. And uh, the regime differs from the cartel regime. I was referring to the damages directive and the practical guide on how to calculate damages, in the sense that uh, there's no fines. So unlike... Um, cartel regime where there are hefty fines and therefore the purpose of a, a remedy in uh, the courts is purely compensatory, there may be grounds for exemplary damages or punitive damages in the case of illegal state aids and that would encourage even more uh, private enforcement. And there are of course uh, tricky issues about when the, uh, for example, if a illegal tax has been imposed on airlines, which is one of the state aid cases and the airlines pass on the tax to their customers, the question is, what does the uh, uh, member state have to recover? I mean, there are legal uh, tax cases where the member state only recovers the, the net amount, that is, the amount not passed on, because the argument being is that someone else has paid, and paid the tax, or part of the tax, and therefore uh, it would be unjust enrichment for the state to recover the full amount of the state aid or the illegal tax that's being paid. So the issue of pass on uh, will arise in these documents. That's just some data on the extent of state aid. So I'll, I'll finish there, and uh, no doubt uh, I'll either be told where I'm wrong, or people will take on <laughs> some of the issues and discuss them more fully. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think this was a very interesting uh, uh, introduction to the uh, to today's debate. Uh, my name, sorry. Uh, okay, no, it's, it's fine. Okay. Uh, my name is Carlos Tagnaro. I've got uh, two bad news and one good news for you. Uh, first bad news uh, is that Rita Paukste, who should have chaired this this panel, unfortunately could make it in Brussels. Uh, second bad news uh, is that I am taking her place. <laughs> the good news is that, as you can hear, my voice is so rotten that I will speak as little as possible. Um, I, I ask uh, the panelists uh, to join myself uh, on wherever we are, sorry. Kön uh, van de Castele, Krasen Stanchev and Ilya Brukeman. I apologize for my pronunciation and all the other things. <laughs> so, uh, Kone Castele 
uh, is a head of unit state aid control at the director general for competition in the European Commission. Uh, Krasen Stanchev uh, is a Bulgarian economist as well as the uh, uh, um, representative of the Institute for Market Economics in Sofia. And Ilya Bruckman uh, heads the single market unit at Eurocommerce, which is the uh, association of uh, European retailers. Uh, the subject of uh, this first panel is, is state aid, fair competition, and procedural uh, challenges. And in a way, I think our panelists will, will be asked to, to uh, start from uh, uh, Professor Velianowski's uh, points that, uh, that you already uh, have just heard. So I'm immediately uh, leaving the floor to uh, Dr. Van de Castele for introducing the issue of, of state aid uh, regulation and state aid discipline in the European Union, again with some regard to, to what Mr. Velianowski just said. And uh, I ask everybody, I mean the panelists, to, to uh, stick more or less, I'm Italian, so more or less, but stick to the five minute uh, uh, deadline that we have been given in order to allow a more, more active and dynamic debate uh, um, among you and with the public. So you have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if this works. Oh, okay, now it works. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, let me maybe start off with uh, recalling one event in the US. Uh, you may remember the shopping around by Amazon to a new headquarters uh, where it basically tried to put into comp in competition various regions and cities trying to squeeze out a maximum of subsidies uh, for, for its location. Of course there was no real incentive effect. Uh, ultimately they were going to have a new headquarters anyway um, and in the end well it was initially New York which basically offered something like two billion in, in tax subsidies uh, for locating this new headquarters in the end. They gave up on it. Uh, but it just shows a little bit that something like this actually would not be possible, at least not as such, uh, in Europe because of the state aid control uh, rules. Um, it was already recalled that uh, in the UK political debate these days, both Mr. Corbyn and Mr. Johnson are criticizing the state aid rules. So they seem to have some effect. Uh, well, maybe Mr. Corbyn is of course regretting somehow that he would not be able to, to provide further support to British Steel, while Mr. Johnson also well, talked about <coughs> some buses, I think both of them actually completely misunderstand stated control rules uh, because both of them actually would not be an obstacle to whatever they, they are mentioning uh, there. Also in the Brexit negotiations, it's interesting to see that the whole issue of level playing field, which boils down to a large extent to the stated rules, is one of the hot topics and is one of the crucial topics as well. And clearly already it is announced several times that this level playing field, amongst others some form of state aid control, will be crucial in any future uh, trade deal. So there must be something to these strange uh, state aid control uh, rules. Now when I saw the topic for this conference I must say I was a bit um, surprised, to put it mildly. Um, some of the questions seemed uh, rather provocative and, and in that sense of course you would not expect me to, 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 to leave this unchallenged. Um, so the first question, do state aid rules support an efficient functioning of the internal market and fair competition? I would say yes. Do state aid rules comply with the following general principles? Now all of these are very uh, high level and, and laudable uh, issues, like the promotion of a market-based economy, private enterprise, prohibiting public institutions from establishing and pursuing commercial activities, Efficient public spending, transparent ex ante and exposed assessment of the compatibility of state aid and strict enforcement of the state aid rules. Well, there unfortunately I have to go back to basics. The state aid treaty, uh, the, the, the state aid rules in the treaty only talk about the distortion of competition. Some of these other laudable objectives like efficient government f uh, f spending are a kind of corollary of uh, this initial aim namely to minimize the distortion of competition. Uh, but as such, I mean to put it very bluntly, if governments waste subsidies through inefficient state aid measures, well maybe that doesn't have so much effect on competition and also not good for public spending. But the primary purpose of state aid control is to try to minimize distortions of competition. 
Second question, which has been uh, put to, to this panel, is the role of stated modernization. Uh, also there, I think rather to the contrary maybe of what was uh, said in the introduction, we think we have gone a little bit in the direction of trying to ensure more transparency. Uh, one of the big novelties which has been introduced is uh, a transparency module. You can actually, by company, find all the aid which has been granted on, on the internet. Furthermore, even if we have a very wide uh, block exemption regulation, uh, one should also not forget that maybe the number of measures which fall under this block exemption regulation sounds very high, and we like to promote that, uh, because indeed we are often criticized of creating red, red tape. Uh, but the 96% which was mentioned before, of course in budgetary terms, uh, represents only a small part, less than half. So we should not forget that either, that still more than half of the budget spent on state aid, on state aid is actually uh, scrutinized by DG competition. Regarding uh, enforcement, uh, we should also not forget that there are some interesting trends uh, to be seen there as well. We have uh, a strong reinforcement by the union courts now of the role of national authorities, of the obligations of national authorities. Uh, the recent judgment in Estepagar basically requires not only the national courts, but any national authority to recover, and I stress this, to recover any unlawful aid. So once the unlawful character has been established, has not been notified to the commission, that, that makes it unlawful, you have to recover. That's a very serious sanction. I'm not sure that member states have already fully grasped the implications of this judgment. But it's very, very uh, uh, novel, and I think it's very important that enforcement will be uh, enhanced a lot. Um, maybe then, because you invited uh, comments, um, uh, counting the words, I don't think is a good way to try to establish whether... Um, the chief uh, shot. The chief shot. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I was once in a panel in, in, in France, just before they had the referendum, on uh, the European Constitution, and there I was attacked in the same way uh, by uh, some uh, member in the audience which had counted the number of times that the service public, the public service, appeared in the European treaties, and basically he came to the conclusion <coughs> that it appeared nowhere, and hence it must be that. Uh, of course, we had a different jargon, so we don't use this term, service public, um, but yeah, that was then the main justification for, for opposing. Uh, the European treaties. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it maybe at this one, this point for, for the introductory part, and of course I'm sure there will be many questions and exchanges with the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. I leave the floor to, to um, Ilya Brugman, uh, who will introduce the issue of, of retail trade, I mean, state aid rules in the context of whatever is happening in the retail trade industry. Please, you've got the floor. Hello, so uh, I work for Eurocommerce, we're the European Association for uh, Retail and Wholesale uh, Association, so we have members in all the European countries. Uh, and I think I'm a bit of an odd breed in the room because I'm not a lawyer and uh, neither state a specialist. But unfortunately, uh, since I, I would say after the crisis uh, from 2008, we've seen more and more uh, retail specific uh, taxes uh, emerging in, uh, in member states. Uh, and um, in these cases, um, we try to go for the most effective mean to, to resolve uh, issues. And there we see that competition law uh, is strongest, obviously, because you, have a, uh, you can issue a suspension injunction uh, and the state aid can immediately be recovered. And if you go for internal market law, so let's say it's freedom of establishment or discrimination, you have to wait for years, uh, everybody suffers damages. Uh, in the meantime, and even when you have a positive outcome, it still means uh, that you uh, don't have your money back. Um, just to give you an idea of what kind of cases we have, so we had in, in Hungary, had the special uh, crisis tax, uh, was 100, I think the total was like 300 million euros that was paid by retail businesses. We had the uh, Hungarian food supply chain fee, which was 100 million euros, um, but this one was um, uh, blocked by uh, an injunction. We had the Slovak retail tax, actually from, uh, this was uh, uh, blocked this year, uh, also supposed to be 100 million euros. We have the Polish retail tax, which was supposed to have revenue of 500 million euros. 
Um, and actually, I guess you know that uh, the appeal of the Commission uh, to the General Court's decision is uh, pending and we expect the outcome at the end of next year. And now we have also uh, a draft retail tax on Lithuania um, um, and we'll have to see how we're going to deal uh, with that. What we can say that if all these laws are different. So we talk about retail taxes, but they're definitely not the same. Um, they are a flat rate or they're a progressive, progressive rate. Uh, sometimes they apply to food, sometimes they apply to food and non-food sales, uh, sometimes to only offline, sometimes offline and online. Um, and also there's a long list sometimes of exemptions. Um, so we say retail taxes, but uh, there are a lot of differences. Um, what we see as a determining factor is the market structure. Um, so what's the, usually these taxes focus on uh, getting money from uh, foreign owned retailers active in the market. So they give a selective advantage uh, to uh, smaller and local retailers. Um, and we also see that the international retailers, they are organized in an integrated way. Uh, so you are taxed as one company and local players are often uh, organized as franchise. So then all the individual franchisees are taxed and then if you introduce an artificial threshold, mm -hmm. then immediately all the local players uh, are out um, and only the big ones have to pay. Um, and I think the attention on the big retailers is a bit that we see, at least in Central Eastern Europe, that the top five players are usually foreign-owned uh, retailers and there are a few local retailers, but we also see there's a lot of, uh, with the digital transformation in our sector and with changing consumer behavior, we see there's a lot of pressure on, on the retail sector and a lot of small retailers are closing down and this leads, I think, to some kind of a, an action from state side to protect these businesses, which obviously makes sense. Um, what I can say about the justifications is that you sometimes you see on paper justifications of these uh, state aid rules are fairly okay, sometimes a bit strange, like I think in the Polish case, yes, retailers, uh, bigger retailers, they make higher turnover, so they are more efficient, so they can easily, easily pay taxes. Uh, and I think this is a bit too easy to say, but if you follow the local debate uh, that forgoes uh, the adoption of a tax, you clearly see it's a discriminatory tax. It's just meant to hurt uh, these foreign players in the market. Um, I would um, maybe to say um, on these overall needs of public interest, uh, we, I know this is not stated, but you also have them for uh, like an internal market uh, law. Uh, so if you look at national measures in uh, effect in the movement of goods or services, it's the same thing. Uh, and there we see that uh, governments use these overriding reasons too easily. So they just say, yes, this is to protect public health. Uh, yes, and there's no proportionality assessment, no impact assessment. So um, then it's very difficult then also to, to have a reasonable discussion, I think, with authorities uh, to, to find uh, some kind of an agreement on, on how you could better do it. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Krasen, uh, you. uh, oh, I, you've got the floor. Uh, first, I think, you know, it's not a cheap uh, move, you know, the counter rates. So, spending some time drafting laws, I know that very well that uh, legal language is like poetry, you know, the less the words, the better, you know. Uh, uh, I know, but uh, seriously, you know, if you have a, a complicated wording of different regulations, then each and every word, uh, you know, requires explanation, 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 and really, you know, it's really important, you know, about how you explain and how it can distinguish, you know, good and bad, you know, in terms of competition. Another thing which is very important, I, I mean, again, responding, you know, to some of the points, um, I basically answer the first question, you know, we were asked, you know, that it is better to have the prohibition of state aid, uh, but it's not working. <laughs> Uh, so why? Because when you have a prohibition, you have uh, an invitation to all the competitors, you know, to watch <coughs> their neighbors' cases, and of course bring a case, you know, to the local uh, or, or European authorities on state aid, which is which is basically okay. I mean, it gives some sort of a, uh, first <coughs> a, a, a right and second incentive. Um, uh, 
and one additional point on transparency model. Uh, transparency was used uh, many times, uh, for example, in Hungary. And uh, the transparency module, they basically tried to nationalize some of the bank ownerships, you know, so on. I mean, they basically kicked out some of the former <coughs> bank owners. Uh, I, I, I basically, I, I tried to understand what this <coughs> transparency model is. Um, and my thinking at this point is that there might be some sort of unintended consequences related to the treatment on local national level, especially given the political moods uh, uh, we are witnessing, you know, all over the Union. Uh, and when the local whatever competition authorities are to be whatever involved in that, you know, it's very likely that they will uh, basically benefit or create privileges, you know, for the local players rather than international players. Uh, and I, uh, I mean, I, I have two minutes. I, I, I decided that I basically tell a story of a case. I have basically written it. It's one page, so you will see it later. So, of a real process on determining whether something is a state aid or not. I think this case is very good because I know it very well. Uh, but also, it's it's one of the strange cases you know you have uh, uh, in, in the commission here. Uh, so these are purchasing power agreements signed by foreign investors, first Italian, then American, whatever, or first American, then Italian, then, then American, and whatever. So uh, before the negotiations started, I mean, the, the, the agreement was drafted, agreements were drafted and then approved by different authorities, including parliament, uh, uh, included in uh, different uh, energy strategies for the countries, before the time negotiations with the European Union started. So then there were three changes in the energy policies <coughs> of, uh, of, of, of the Union. Uh, the agreements were signed in 2001. So in uh, 2006, uh, the, the, the investment was already, already there. The very nature of the agreements was very important in several respects. Uh, number one, lignite powered uh, uh, thermal power plants they had to meet European Union standards. So the only way to finance them in, uh, in, in 98, 99, was you know, that you have such an agreement, purchasing power agreement, not a direct investment scheme, because at the time, uh, Bulgarian foreign debt to GDP was about uh, the size of the Greek one. So it would have been very expensive to buy uh, credit you know, somewhere else. So in the meantime, uh, there were several European Union sponsored exemptions on state aid, like uh, subsidizing the renewables. Carlo has a very good point about uh, wind power in Italy. Uh, I have lots of similar points in other countries. So, so, so at, by, by 2013, when a Bulgarian regulator opened a case against Bulgarian institutions, against these two investors with the European Union, the subsidization, of course, subsidization was adamant everywhere in the power sector. And this is, was not only renewables, but different uh, 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 price regulatory schemes, different uh, uh, advantages uh, 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 creating infrastructure to private investors, transferring you know, some of the privileges of public companies to private, and at the same time, the very location where these two investors operate, there is a state-owned enterprise, which, and I have one more sentence, uh, state-owned ent enterprise, which was uh, uh, financed through a, a development bank, foreign development bank, with a government guarantee. So in all this, the, the, the offtake of the of the electricity of these two companies is a state-owned company. So, uh, summarizing everything in one sentence. So, with, uh, uh, with, with the state sector, you have too many opportunities to, 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 to intervene. So, and I 
don't see you know, uh, a, a solution to that. Okay, optimism. Uh, I, I, I would have a second round of questions and then maybe if anybody from the public wants to uh, ask questions or make comments, they are welcome. Um, one, uh, uh, one, one point raised by uh, Santovelianovsky is, uh, to summarize it, that uh, state aid discipline is in a way too little too late. And I would like to focus on the too late point. Uh, of course, making an assessment of state aid takes time and quite often it may happen that, that when the, a decision comes, it, I mean the, the, the competition has already been distorted. Just an example, I'm an Italian so I can tell it, you open an, an investigation on the uh, bridge loan to Alitalia I, I think a couple of years ago, in the meantime we have given two other uh, loans uh, uh, to the same company. Of course whenever you make a decision the problem will, will have become bigger and bigger and bigger than, than when you started. Uh, so my question is, is there anything that you believe could be done to make the process faster? Well, yes and no. I think we have already advanced. One of the reasons that we have such a wide block exemption regulation is to shift the attention more to the harmful cases, to the cases that really matter. Um, sometimes, of course, I mean, to, 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 to come back to your example, we run after the facts. I mean, if uh, a member state uh, continues to, to change plans, uh, then you need to reassess every time the new plan uh, adopt a decision. And in, in that sense, you're, you're running behind uh, if, if you don't have a stable plan for a company. Uh, because ultimately our decision needs to stand up in court, otherwise it's even worse uh, if our decision gets annulled. And that's maybe to come back also to the retail taxes. I mean, there the Commission has uh, indeed taken action, has decided uh, that this indeed <coughs> constitutes uh, state aid and is very harmful for competition. Uh, however, the Union Courts decided, at least in the first instance, that um, the burden of proof might be higher. And that's one of the specificities if you then turn into the, the, the specific <coughs> taxes, uh, separate from the corporate tax, that the burden of proof imposed on the Commission is very high. Um, and of course, if you take that into account, uh, yeah, that means that our investigations will require quite some time to try to establish all the necessary facts, all the necessary elements, so that we have a decision which stands up in court. The impact on the market, I mean, yes, there is uh, potentially, I mean, the, there is a, a limit to the remedy we can impose. Uh, it's the recovery of the money which has been granted, uh, including uh, the recovery interest, so such the time value of money is taken into account. It's maybe an imperfect uh, remedy that it cannot fully restore uh, the situation ex ante. Nevertheless, I am not aware of many companies who, who <coughs> like to suffer uh, the remedy. So somehow it still seems to have some kind of penalty element to it. Uh, yeah, so in that sense, we try to act as quickly as possible. The GBER has allowed to free up resources. On the other hand, we see also that the requirements, uh, burden of proof on the Commission are higher and higher. And that, of course, requires then a bit of time as well. So there is a bit of this tension that we have to deal with. And, and, and uh, Ilya Brofman, uh, one, one feeling I have in talking about the state aid discipline is that it may be relatively effective when you have to go after large companies because they basically have no way to run away, they, 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 are, they are still there. Uh, it may be harder to recover the, the state aid from smaller companies who may more easily disappear or close and, and reopen with a different name and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm uh, interested in understanding whether uh, you believe it, it, it is like this and, and if, is there anything you believe that could be done to make it easier to implement uh, state aid discipline also in sectors where the average size of the firms is very, is very small? Um, well, obviously we, we specifically talk about yeah, uh, these taxes, yeah, yeah. right? So uh, actually I think state is a very effective instrument if you are on time. 
and I think with these decisions, which some of them were challenged, uh, there was also uh, the decision to, uh, to, uh, to issue an injunction before the first payment was due. So this also meant that, uh, and we were very grateful for that, that DG Competition worked very fast to, I mean, this is basically, we already tried to inform you before the law was adopted, and then you have like usually three, four months uh, to take a decision. Um, and uh, it is, I would say, it is easy for a government to recover the state aid, because you just give the money back that was paid to uh, the large companies. The other way around, uh, then levying the tax over smaller companies, yeah, that was not the intention of the legislator. So that's probably the, le the least favorable option they would take. But that it is difficult uh, if, uh, if you go from an internal market angle, I think that shows the Hungarian retail crisis tax. And uh, this was a tax in place from 2010 to 2012. Um, and there was a, a, a court case, a preliminary ruling of a private company uh, for the European court where the European court said this tax is in, uh, directly discriminatory. And then uh, from all the companies that pay this tax, obviously they went to the Hungarian uh, court, uh, and none of those companies up till now have their money back. Uh, so now there is one case, uh, uh, I guess it's going to be uh, quite soon actually, the, it's a, the Tesco versus Hungary case, where we expect uh, a ruling and but you can imagine this is now 2019, and this tax, the tax revenue was 300 million euros. And this is the Hungarian market. So this is a lot of money for such a market. So, so in that respect, I think if you're able to, to take a decision before the first payment and, and, and issue an injunction, very effective. Internal market remedies are less. Uh, and uh, depending on the willingness of the government, it may take a very long time. Uh, I would like to have you defending state aid discipline, actually. And my question is, this, what, what's your take on, on uh, all the debate we have now ongoing in Europe about the need for a more muscular uh, industrial policy and uh, the need to introduce more derogations from, from the uh, state aid discipline when uh, you have to create European champions? In this respect, the European Union will resemble the Eurasian Economic Union. So, I mean, they have an agreement between themselves about uh, certain policy, and who wins is China. <laughs> so, something of the sort will be uh, will be European Union, but more complicated. You know, the winners will not be Europeans. It will be probably, to some extent, North America. I'm not sure to what. Uh, Russia and China, of course. I mean, that's the truth. <laughs> okay, thanks. Is there any uh, question or comment? Uh, okay, uh, no, so may I add, add something? One of the things you know we missed this year is to, uh, uh, to, to, to focus on how the common, whatever, economic, whatever space of the Soviet Union was working. So there were lots of, lots of lessons not learned from that. So, and one of the uh, one of the issues which created <coughs> large economic inefficiency was the division of labor, so to say, between the member states, you know, supporting different, uh, uh, different whatever, competitive sectors, uh, economic growth sectors, drivers. You know, if you look at Christine Lagarde uh, uh, with uh, Bonchard and others, you know, the argument on the new policies of ECB, we are going into that direction. Yes, there is a question over there. Please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much for a very enlightening uh, panel here. My name is Wolfgang Papa. I'm working uh, associated with the uh, Center for European Policy Studies, formerly in the Commission. You mentioned China, and that brings me, of course, to the discussion Chinese SOEs. They are, as well, here on the market. They have quite an impact, even in the banking sector, uh, not to mention Huawei and others. How far are they treated as uh, they are under the state aid issue? Because they get state aid from the Chinese Communist Party even, more or less directly sometimes. Can they be uh, judged at all? We know in the WTO there's a big discussion about SOEs now, but how far is the Commission able to intervene here? Thank you. Maybe you want to comment on this? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think if you look 
for the, for the moment, it cannot under state aid rules. It is only about money granted by member states. Um, but if you look at the mission letter for uh, our commission, for, uh, for Vice President now, uh, Commissioner Westeyer, you will see that she is actually entrusted with a task to come up with a new instrument to look into this. So to try to create, again, this idea of a level playing field. So we will have to see what comes out of this exercise, but there is a clear mandate to look into this and to try to ensure a level playing field. I mean, I think that is not only focusing, of course, on China. I mean, there will also be precisely the UK after a Brexit. Again, the same issue. If they are not maintaining some form of state aid control, you, you may have similar issues. Uh, the, the, the China case is, is, is not only about China. Uh, one of the ways to tackle that it's, it's a challenge, you know, it's uh, Turkey, the Volkswagen, whatever idea to set up a plant there. I'm not sure they will eventually set up a plant, but that's another story. Uh, this is not only China, this is Russia to a great extent. Um, so I think what can be done, it is through the free trade agreements, you know, the European Union has, because the Union has an advantage of... Not with China. Sorry? Not with China. Not well, not with China, yes, I, I know. You know. It will be very difficult to change anything there. Uh, but the, the advantage the Union has is that it is rich and it is relatively big. So it is the richest market. And everybody wants to trade with the richer <coughs> market because if they trade with the poorer market, they will become poor, obviously. So something of the sort is, to the extent there is some sense, I don't think there is much of a sense of uh, Trump's policies, but he, he, he is trying to use this whatever market power uh, or market share or, the, or global share of the US economy you know, to impose you know, what, uh, uh, what's needed you know, for, for the US. I'm, of course, I'm not defending anything. You know, I basically believe that you know, the response of the European Union to the policies uh, of Trump is to, is, is, to do, is to do three things, liberalize, liberalize, and liberalize further. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I, I, I've got a question for you. Uh, the third point that was raised by uh, the organizer was, was about state aid thresholds. Uh, state aid disciplines applies only to, to aid above a certain threshold, uh, which is relatively low, uh, but it is the same all over Europe. Now, uh, uh, the same amount of money in, like, Germany uh, is something totally different from the same amount of money, li like in, in Bulgaria, which is, I think, the, the uh, EU member state with the lowest GDP per capita, I think. Uh, uh, so, does it m make sense to... Uh, maintain the same traction, or do you think would it be better to, to at least adjust to, to purchasing power uh, parity, the, the uh, level above which you scrutinize state aid? Well, of course state aid control in the first place is, a, is an instrument which serves the internal market, which starts from the hypothesis that there is an internal market, which means that we are not talking about national markets. Um, we have if you look at the agriculture area, um, a de minimis, and also in, in the fisheries sector, a, a de minimis rule, which is adjusted for the GDP per capita. Um, I am not sure it helps a lot. It, it makes matters rather complicated. Uh, rather than having one single threshold in the whole of Europe, which everybody might be aware of, uh, to have differentiation across member states makes matters rather difficult. So I'm not sure. I don't think that all in all our, our thresholds are extremely generous. I mean, they are rather to the country, I think, relatively conservative. Uh, in any event, we are going through the motions right now of evaluating our rules, uh, getting feedback from all interested parties to try to see whether or not there is a need to adjust our rules. And of course, that can go both ways. 
if we got it wrong first time and were too generous, we might lower some of the aid intensities. If, on to the contrary, we perceive that the, the effect or the impact on competition is really minimal, we might increase certain thresholds. You spend, uh, spend a lot of time talking about how taxes can, can distort competition in the retail trade, but also regulations can, can actually uh, uh, have the same, uh, the same result. I'm thinking, for example, about Sunday closing laws or, or other kind of regulations. Uh, do you think it would, be, it would make sense to increase the degree of, of uh, enforcement of competition rules uh, uh, even on, on these kind of issues? Uh, uh, speaking specifically about retail trade, or do you believe that uh, uh, these issues are local in nature, so it, it, it is very difficult to, to move upwards and find one common rule uh, all over Europe? Um, well, there are so many of these uh, rules that it's difficult to say, um, you know, uh, let's say Sunday closing. Um, if you would drop this question into a group of our members, everybody will have a different opinion, and it's also organized in very different ways for the very different reasons. So, uh, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> but, I think if you, and it, maybe this links a bit to, to the, the, the China angle, um, with the digital transformation, we see there's a lot of competition from third countries. And I think if we go back to these taxes, I mean, these, these are turnover-based. Uh, and retail, by definition, it's uh, high turnovers and very low margins, especially for food. It's like a few percent. So if you introduce a tax of 1% of uh, the turnover, it means that immediately some players uh, will uh, make a loss. That's, that's a fact. I mean, it's inevitable. So this has a huge impact. At the same time, we see from third countries like China, a lot of imports, direct imports from consumers. Uh, and these products, uh, they are not compliant with EU rules. Um, so this creates a gap, so they are subsidized uh, when they are sent to Europe. Uh, they don't meet our standards, so they are uh, cheaper than the products sold by uh, genuine uh, players in the market. And then we're going to introduce all these type of measures. I mean, you can imagine, like, we talk a lot about Euro creating European champions. I think we have a lot of uh, big European retailers that have the potential to be European champion and actually to compete at the global stage. But the way I think European or legislators in Europe, so at EU level and at national level, are uh, approaching the sector. Uh, I mean, the question is not how do we want to regulate retail, no, how do we want a European retail sector to look like in 10 years' time? And I can tell you, like, the way it's going now, I forget about it. It's going to be uh, third country operators that are going to dominate the market, and we already see in a number of countries that actually online for non-food, that the, the majority of the market is from uh, dominated by non-EU players, and this is a trend, and it will only increase. Uh, so I think, I think if you think of uh, the only way how you can enable European companies to win is to make it easier to do business here than outside, and the innovation and the development is now happening in the United States and in China, and the only thing I see when legislators talk about how to deal with these issues is by uh, introducing protectionist measures or more uh, regulation. And it's just the complete opposite way to go about it. And I don't know exactly how you can translate this into competition law, but you have to give companies a chance to become uh, a European champion and to be able to compete with uh, operators from elsewhere. And I don't see this happening now. I mean, from, from a legal, strictly legal point of view, state aid discipline only refers to uh, money transfer to, to, to businesses. But there are many ways to provide state aid, including uh, uh, regulatory uh, decisions. In the, in the note you sent us uh, um, illustrating the, the energy, the case uh, in, in Bulgarian energy that you told about, that you told us about. You also mentioned uh, electricity price regulation as a form of indirect state aid. Would you like to uh, speculate a little bit on this? On the, on, on the specific Bulgarian case? Or uh, well, yeah, as you wish, you, you can start from the Bulgarian case and, and expand the issue for one. Uh, 
I decided to go first to a real case and second from the energy sector because the energy policy is one of the most, whatever, the temporary thing, you know, in the European Union. Uh, and second, uh, um, these are half of the exemptions, not half of them, probably one third of the exemptions is related to environment, energy, and whatever. Um, so I, I think here, the, 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 that there are two, I mean, with price regulation, there are two things. Number one is to what extent is the market is liberalized, and second, to what extent those who are believed to be vulnerable are being held by different whatever quasi-price mechanisms, be this uh, subsidies to poor families and whatever. So, they, they, if the market is fully liberalized, then I believe many of the things would have been happening as they are happening, including renewables, clean diesel, you name it. So, but because the market is not liberalized, and because when the European Union is not doing a proper regulatory impact analysis on what is going on in the energy sector, in broad sense, you know, from renewables, palm oil, you know, coal, clean diesel, and that sort of stuff, then the Union itself is often creating market distortions by regulation. And this is a market distortion which is not only on the European soil, this is a market distortion around the globe because the market is really big for, for most of the things, you know, related to, uh, to, to energy. So as to the, uh, to, to the Union, I'm not sure to what extent it is possible, but the Union's energy market, you know, to be really common, there must be some sort of a common uh, pattern of, 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 of price regulation or price uh, whatever mechanism setting. So I believe, you know, what makes quasi-subsidy uh, in some countries, especially the new member states, uh, Hungary, Romania to some extent, Bulgaria, and if sometime down the road, you know, the Balkans will come, the Western Balkans will become members of, of the Union, this will be a major issue because in those countries you have a very different ratio between industrial use of, uh, uh, of, of electricity and uh, uh, final consumption, whole household consumption of electricity. So for those countries I've mentioned, the household consumption is higher than the industrial, but with very little, with about 15 20%. So the, 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 the issue here is that the industrial use of energy goes into the value chain. You know, the final consumption does not go into the value chain. So, in fact, the, 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 the provisionally lower price, initial price, you know, for industrial users is basically, you know, going into the value chain and it is taxed and that sort of stuff down the road, you know, which is very different, you know, in the, uh, in, 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 in the countries I've mentioned. So, if the market, for example, for electricity is to be a single market, you know, there must be some sort of a rule on this. I'm looking around to see if there is any other question or comment. No, so I, I, I go on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one of the uh, most prominent state aid cases in the past few years was the Apple case. Uh, the commission argued that it was a, a, a sort of ad, ad, ad hominem uh, tax reduction that, that was interpreted as in violation of the uh, state aid discipline. Others uh, have argued that actually uh, the uh, commission's position uh, resulted in preventing the member state to pursue the, uh, its favorite uh, uh, fiscal policy. Could you please uh, briefly reassess why do you believe that that, that actually was a state aid and it was not just uh, uh, you know entering into uh, limiting the the, the uh, sovereignty of a member state well i mean one of the crucial elements in state aid control is this was already introduced in the beginning there needs to be a kind of discriminatory element to it so it needs to be what, what is called in our jargon selectivity which means that we need to be able to show that 
somehow a company receives a differentiated treatment from all the other companies. Uh, we think we have established that in the Apple case. Uh, we had um, recently the judgment in uh, Fiat and, and Starbucks where um, the principles were actually endorsed by the general court even if we lost on, on, on the matter of proof in the Starbucks case, the fundamental principles underpinning both Fiat, Starbucks, and then ultimately the Apple case, we believe were actually confirmed by the court. Uh, so the, again, if one starts from the general corporate tax system in a member state and then looks at how it is applied and one can identify, which we believe we have done, that there is a kind of preferential or separate treatment of certain companies deviating from the general corporate tax system, then we believe we have established a state aid. So it is not about limiting um, competition, tax competition between different member states. The fact that, that Ireland has a corporate tax rate, I believe, of 12% doesn't really matter. Uh, that is not a state aid issue. What is a state aid issue is um, the differentiated or the separate treatment, the preferential treatment, that we believe that a company like Apple has received or uh, that companies like uh, 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 Starbucks, Fiat and the other cases we have dealt with, NG and so on, have received uh, in the different jurisdictions. Thank you. One emerging uh, uh, um, uh, dimension of competition in retail trade is uh, online versus offline uh, uh, retail trade. Um, many people argue that online operators actually enjoy a, a favorable fiscal treatment <laughs> eh? and therefore uh, taxes on online transactions have been proposed both at the European and national level. Uh, I understand, I, I imagine that this is another uh, hot issue within your organization, so uh, but, but I, I would like to, to ask you what is your perception of, of this kind of problem and if you believe there is, uh, there actually is a, a, a sort of distortion in competition because of the ability of online operators to locate themselves uh, in, in different jurisdictions from, from the, the, the one where they, they sell products. Now I have to be careful of what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> because we have, uh, like I said, we have a broad membership, so it's uh, online, offline, and omni-channel, so... Uh, I, I'm uh, Italian, so I know the value of silence. All right. <laughs> no, 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 but I can say something about that. Um, first, I think um, the future of retail is omni-channel. So, meaning that you find a successful way to integrate the online and the offline environment. So when legislators talk about offline, online, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's an old-fashioned way of looking at things. You could even argue that talking about the digital single market is the same thing, because you have to integrate the digital and the physical world, and that's what we are doing. So the moment when you come up with legislation which only affects one part or one dimension of your operations, uh, it's going to cause problems. It's going to cause frictions. Um, on the other hand, we see in um, uh, member states um, taxes, again, um, that only target one dimension. <coughs> and that's difficult because let's say if we go back to, let's go to the small retailer. I'm in a, I'm in a town center and I'm trying to survive. Uh, my biggest competitor is an online uh, store who is on a distribution center like 50 kilometers away from the city center. So if I introduce taxes on, uh, based on uh, the size of my store, based on my presence in a city center, I cannot win this battle. I will lose, definitely. So I think in this case, taxes need to be fair, but all measures need to be fair, and, uh, because otherwise you undermine the level playing field for uh, the, the retail businesses. Uh, and I mean, look at, for instance, that you have the Spanish uh, retail tax case where it's also a tax based on square meters. So if you are above a certain threshold, you have to pay a tax. But this is applies to big companies. But in Tescom, I think it's uh, from 400 square meters. And all these taxes have a distorting effect. I mean, no doubt. 
discussion. Uh, I found very interesting your discussion about the energy sector because that's a heavily regulated sector where it is easier than, than in other uh, parts of the economy to hide the state aid. Um, I think uh, back in 2014 the Commission released the uh, uh, guidelines on uh, uh, state aid in the energy environment sector. Do you believe that is a, a reasonable response to such a complex sector or, or it is still unsatisfactory? Uh, I remember your case on, uh, on the wind uh, power subsidization. Uh, in <coughs> Uh, I did similar on, uh, on, on photovoltaics, uh, in, not only in Bulgaria, but in other countries as well. Uh, I would think that all this, whatever, price subsidization, of course, they, they are not treated as state aid because there is no financial transfer, you know, from the taxpayers, you know, to to, to, to any preferential, whatever, preferentially treated uh, uh, company or set of companies, although at the end of the day, you know, there is a preference, you know, when you, when you have a subsidization and policies like this. One of the results, actually, was in Bulgaria that, uh, you know, out of 240 uh, members of parliament, one had 30 of them, you know, had, 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 had shares <coughs> in the photovoltaic companies, you know. And one of the results of the policy in Italy was that 97% of the contracts of photovoltaics went to mafia, which is also a very interesting phenomenon. You know? So what, what needs to be done is just to get rid of the subsidies. You know? Not, if you have a policy of something, you know, so it must be much more uh, modest and not subsidy driven. Because subsidies always, you know, so I think Gentry had uh, participated in a book on 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 on, on, on the wrong coast, yeah. So subsidy always creates, you know, a deviation. Always, there is no. And then, when when you have a deviation of the market, at the end of the day, you know, subsidy creates a false economy. And when there is a false economy, there there is a regulatory drive to regulate everything, you know. So, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a perpetuum mobile, so to say, which, which is costly at the end of the day. Okay, I've got two questions, uh, uh, Sento, and, and then the lady over there. Yeah, just a question for Mr. Lander, just still. Um, you, you said that the burden of proof imposed on the Commission by the European Court is high. Did you actually mean burden of proof or you mean the standard of proof? And why is it very high? Um, well, what we see in, in, in the tax cases is certainly that uh, the courts require a lot from us. Um, so, so yes, I, I think there is a kind of inherent reflex uh, with the union courts that tax competences rest with member states, and so that to demonstrate that there might be a state aid issue in tax matters, um, the courts tread very carefully and require a lot from the Commission. You, there is one last question over there. Yes. Uh, my name is Antonella Pineva, I work for Saska Group. My question is actually to all uh, the panelists. Do you think that uh, the dialogue with the national competition regulators is efficient and works? Because at the end of the day, they should be the first ones scrutinizing national legislation and check uh, whether there is a competition issue <laughs> with regard to state aids. And, uh, or do you think that actually they have sort of devolved this watchdog uh, activity to the European Commission? Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, in state aid control, there is no obligation uh, for, with regard to the national competition authorities. There is a huge variation across member states. In some member states, we have relatively strong competition authorities, which also take a role in, in state aid matters. 
uh, we usually welcome that. It's, it is very useful to have this kind of first screening, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps preventing accidents. In other member states, the choice has been made not to do so. And that, well, at least our perception is that in some instances that can more easily lead to accidents which we would have liked not to see. Um, well, I think one of the, the key issues here is the intention of the government. And what we see in a lot of member states, member states or governments know what they're doing, and they're doing it on purpose. So they're doing something bad, they're doing something wrong, and they are aware about it. And sometimes they even try to uh, circumvent the, the, the normal legislative procedures by having MPs proposing uh, new laws, and then you don't have to do impact assessments, you can shorten decision-making procedures, uh, and uh, you can also limit the stakeholder uh, involvement. Um, in, uh, I think in most countries, the competition authorities uh, give uh, an advice or an opinion, and actually the, that opinion is very often favorable to us. Uh, and I think uh, now recently in Lithuania, you know, the competition authority has given a favorable opinion in, in for, for us about this tax proposal. So uh, for different reasons, it's it's uh, bad for competition in Lithuania, and you see that uh, the government ignores it, basically, and they use actually a fast track procedure via the budget process. So. Um, yeah, I think the only way you can solve this is maybe giving uh, uh, competition authorities more weight in, the, in that matter. Mm -hmm. Because now they can basically be ignored mm -hmm. in most cases. Yeah, the competition authority in Vilnius, you know, it was favorable you know, to, to, to the retailers. The competition authority in Sofia was again, because we were fighting to know a similar case for eight years, successfully. But it was not the case with the competition authority in Budapest. Because uh, like five years or six years ago, when they introduced the food law, you know, the food tax, you know, it hit the, it hit the retailers first. So at the same time, you know, coming to my initial point, I believe that even in this forum, the prohibition of state aid, you know, is still useful because it allows, whatever the level, be this national or, or, or European, to make a case. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the case. <laughs> so, of course, you know, here, here is a problem, you know, with, uh, with, with foreign companies which receive uh, some sort of a support or being state-owned and being subsidized, you know, by taxpayers of China, <coughs> Russia, or whatever. Uh, so, this is a very difficult uh, thing here, you know. So, WTO, I mean, I tend to mention, you know, the WTO rules are somehow applied here. But I, I, mean, I think the process of arguing on, on behalf of the, the, the WTO agreements, you know, using <coughs> as an argument, uh, you know, the rules there, you know, is even more lengthy process than, than, than what we had in the end. Thank you. I, I, I have one last question to, to uh, Mr. De Castelle just to prepare the next panel. Uh, in the... Uh, European state aid discipline, uh, there is no distinction between st the nature of ownership of companies, between state-owned and privately-owned companies. Uh, would you say that uh, when, when a state-owned company is involved in a state aid case, the probability of, uh, for the state uh, of being found uh, guilty is greater? I try to find the most uh, <laughs> diplomatic way of asking it. Well, I don't think there is an easy answer to give. Um, uh, I mean, again, the, the treaty requires neutrality as regards ownership. So whether it's pro private or public doesn't matter. Now, of course, if you have a public company and there is a money mm -hmm. flow from, from the government, well, that looks like state aid. Um, prima facie. So, from that point of view, you would automatically be a bit suspicious about these money flows. Uh, but there is indeed the, 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 the escape card, uh, which was mentioned before. You have something which is called the market economy operator. Um, which means that, yes, we have to try to assess whether 
a private <laughs> owner would have done the capital injection or whatever transaction took place with this public company. Um, this is an assessment, and again, there we come a little bit to the burden of proof, uh, about whether or not there is state aid uh, present in the first place, which means it's an objective notion. The Commission has the burden of proof. So we must demonstrate that this money flow to this public company constitutes state aid. Now, that burden of proof, again, is not always easy to bring. So, so, it, what about money flows from state-owned companies to other companies? Let me make an example with no reference whatsoever to what is happening in my country. <laughs> Let's assume a state-owned train company is buying a stake uh, in a failed uh, uh, airline. Is it possible that this can be viewed uh, as a state aid? Uh, yes, it could be state aid. Um, I mean, again, what is clear is if you have a state-owned company that any transaction it does constitutes state resources. There is, however, an additional element uh, of proof, again, which needs to be brought, uh, which in our jargon is called imputability. We need to be able to, to, to show that all of this is basically happening upon the direction, upon the instigation of the member state concerned. And that is a case-by-case -case assessment. We can rely on a series of indicators, but it's not always easy. You don't necessarily find your smoking gun, which shows that the minister picked up the phone and instructed the CEO of, of the state-owned company, please do this, or maybe not even please, but just do this transaction um, now. Um, and then in regard, regardless of, of whatever economic considerations might be behind it. Uh, again, it's a difficult exercise, but of course there is, again, a kind of prima facie suspicion. We will certainly try to look into this kind of transactions, and then we will have to see whether there are there is sufficient evidence to demonstrate that this test of imputability is met. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I, I think we are uh, yeah. over time. Uh, there is. Uh, oh, okay. We have time for. Th there was a last yeah. question. Okay. Very very last question. This is the Italian definition of last question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara Mischkova, Ore, Alliance of uh, New Real Entrants. Uh, my question is for the Commission uh, or regarding the burden of proof. Do you think that you have enough tools to get the data? Because I, I think and I assume it's super difficult to get the data from the member states because I think even the member states either say they don't have it or they really don't have it. So how do you, do you have the tools to, to have the data to be able to carry the burden of proof? Well, in the context of the stated modernization, we have endowed ourselves with some further tools, which allows what is called market information tools. So we can go into the market and ask questions. Uh, that's helpful. Problem is that the procedure, again, uh, takes time. So there we get again to, to the initial question, doesn't it take too long, Does, don't your remedies come too late? Um, I think generally, in most instances, we manage to collect the necessary evidence, but yes, it is a time-consuming exercise. Now, of course, it's difficult to say whether it's sufficient, because usually when we have not found the necessary evidence, the question is, does it, is it because the evidence doesn't exist or because our tools are, are, are lacking? And, and that I can't really answer. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a short break of 15 minutes and then we are back. A little logistical announcement. The coffee break will take place downstairs where you already had lunch. And we're going to meet here again at half past. Don't worry, we're going to come pick you up again as well. <laughs> and uh, enjoy. <laughs>